Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Nina Burley is with us. Nina Burley is an accomplished journalist and a New York Times bestselling author. She has written a marvelous new book entitled Virus with the dawning subtitle Vaccines, the CDC, and the Hijacking of America's Response to the Pandemic. In the book, she explores official malfeasance, conspiracy theories, and the contempt for science that we've all witnessed during the past chaotic year. We're pleased to welcome Nina Burley back to the program. Hi, Nina. Hi, Jim. Congratulations on your book. It's really marvelous. Um, now, uh, I wanted to ask you because everyone is wondering, how did you manage to turn around a book like this in about a year's time? Well, you know, it was less than a year, actually. The publisher called and asked me if I would write a book in December, uh, well, early December, late November, and he wanted it by March. And um, it was a, he wanted a short book. It's not as long as a normal book, but it's it's a bit shorter. And it um, it just poured out of me. I said, you know, I'll, he wanted a book about the race to the vaccine. And I said, I'll write about the race to the vaccine if you will let me write a chapter about what happened to the CDC and the government in this, you know, in these months when everybody was in such a panic and there was so much chaos and it was very difficult to keep track of what was going on. So it just poured out of me. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I'd been thinking about it for months, you know, as you probably were and everybody else looking at what happened. And I thought somebody needs to sit down and write down what happened and how it happened. And because I had covered the Trump administration, as you know, for five years for Newsweek and have covered politics for many years before that, I felt that I understood what the sort of foundations were behind the decision-making that led to this appearance of, of utter chaos, which I don't believe was what was going on. I think there was deliberation behind, uh, behind a lot of what we thought was utter chaos. Well, I think your book starts with the history of pandemics, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I guess you start with uh, the Black Plague in, uh, in Europe in the Middle Ages, the bubonic plague. Now, that was uh, uh, found in rats and then spread by fleas. Uh, is there any similarity between the response to the Black Plague in the Middle Ages, uh, social distancing, and the like, and uh, and what we've recently seen. I mean, there are 50 million uh, dead in Europe as a result of the Black Plague. Yes, uh, there are similarities, and uh, you know, when when we were when we went into lockdown in March of 2020, uh, we came up to uh, we were lucky to have this place in the country, and we came up to the country. Our kids were sent home from school, and we didn't want to stay in the apartment, so. We were up here and I have a big library. You can see it behind me. I'm an English major, so I had all the books from grad school. And one of them was Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year. And that book um, is about a, um, a plague that uh, struck London in the late 17th century. The similarities are uh, astonishing actually, because this was you know, 300, some 300, 250, 300 years ago, you know, they didn't have antibiotics. They didn't have, uh, they didn't have, you know, the th any of the things that we have. And yet the similar behavior in, you know, we, we're, we're, we're hundred, several hundred years later, we have uh, not changed. We still um, uh, relied on quack cures. We looked to conspiracy theories for explanations of what was going on. Um, people resisted lockdowns. Um, people went running through the streets and had to be um, had to be collared and sent back to their homes after months in lockdown. Um, the rich fled the cities, the poor stayed and died. Many, many things about disease um, epidemics did, has not changed in, in hundreds of years. And I think that this is uh, that our generation, even though we have the internet and we have antibiotics and we have hospitals and we have ambulances and we have airplanes and we have um, you know, nuclear medicine, um, the human reaction is the same because really for millennia until about 200 years ago, Jim, we were helpless. 
utterly helpless against these types of diseases, infectious disease, we're utterly helpless. We, you were only lucky if you didn't get it. And only about 200 some years ago did the first vaccine get invented and a, a source of assistance began to develop the platform of the, the, uh, the, the vaccine, the attenuated virus vaccine that really changed everything. For, uh, for the human race. So I think we're sort of conditioned to react the same way that our ancestors did. Let's move on to the Spanish flu of 1917. Now it's interesting uh, that it was called the Spanish flu because the first reported case was in Kansas. Uh, and there's a certain xenophobia attached to these pandemics. I mean, Trump uh, called the coronavirus the, the China virus. Uh, and why is that? Nothing new about that either. You know, the the when when the when the plague or when cholera would um, would strike in Europe, the uh, there was always it was always coming from somewhere else. It was always coming from Egypt or you know the ships. If you go to you know these coastal towns in Europe, I was in Norway last year for a while. There's on, on the coast, uh, all of these little towns have have um, quarantine areas right near the, the the where the ports were because they would quarantine for 40 days i mean quarantine quarantina comes from the the uh italian word for 40. at 40 it would put people aside for 40 days so it was always coming from somewhere else and that's the that's the uh the mentality and yes of course we you know we we had the former administration was rather xenophobic nativist so they would say that and they were they were in the you know, I would say the sinophobic category already before this happened. Um, but why they named the Spanish flu, the Spanish flu, I'm not clear on. I need to look that up, Jim, because I, I know I've heard that and I, I don't actually understand why that, why that was. Well, it was devastating. Uh, it claimed uh, 50 to 100 million people worldwide, about 675,000 in the United States uh, compared with COVID 3.2 million in the world and uh, almost 590,000 in the US. Uh, and uh, in World War I, the Spanish flu accounted for half of the battlefield deaths. And one of the victims was uh, Trump's own grandmother. But the Spanish flu seems to have been buried in the dustbin mm -hmm. of history. Mm -hmm. That's true. Spanish flu killed his grandfather, actually, uh, Trump. His grandmother went on to found the Trump Organization, was a whole, which is a That's whole right. Fascinating little tidbit, and of course, he never mentions that. And you know, when he was he was presiding over this crisis, and he never, you know, it, 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 like a normal, compassionate person would say, "Yes, I understand." You know, my grandfather actually died of one of these things, but he didn't look back. The family didn't look back. But that wasn't. That's not sort of a Trumpian aberrance. The whole society did not look back. And I've actually written a little bit about this uh, more recently that. The forgetting of the pandemic of 1918, 1919 is a is a really interesting phenomenon that we need to look at now because what we don't want to do is forget about it. We don't want to forget what this was like because it'll happen again and again, and we need to remember and take lessons from it. So why did people look away from it? There are many possible theories. One is that um, the uh, deaths by by virus are not like deaths by uh, by you know in war in wartime. So uh, you know soldiers get commemorated, uh, people who die in battle get commemorated. Uh, but if you die of a virus, you can't say that person died for a reason. You're just unlucky. So we don't like to think about those things, and I think that's one reason it's we we don't look back on it um, and and commemorate it. And we should, because the um, you know one of the things that we need to be really mindful of in the society that we're not, especially in the last years when we become so anti-expert, so anti-PhD, so DIY, so you know make America great again like Grandpa was, uh, everything was good then. It's not that the advances of medical science are amazing, remarkable. Um, and, and this vaccine that people are still refusing to take, the, the, uh, the mRNA vaccine, is a completely new platform. It is, a, it is built on a generation of new kind of science, this nuclear, uh, you know, looking inside the, the genetics, the genetic 
science that is at the base of this is, is remarkable. It's a milestone in, in medicine and it's, it's going to change the way that vaccines are, are done. It can change the way that it's going to change the way certain illnesses are treated. Um, and we're so spoiled because our generation, anybody who's 70 or over, I mean, under, sorry, anybody who's 70 or under grow, born in say the mid century, mid 20th century and later, we are beneficiary, beneficiaries of enormous amounts of vaccines that, that changed the, uh, the lifespan of Americans. Deb, you know, went from in 1900, the lifespan of the, uh, the average lifespan was 48 and 49. If you're born in 2019, your lifespan is, is 78 to 80 in, or 75 to 80, depending on your socioeconomic situation in this country. An enormous part of that has to do with the fact that in before the mid 20th century, if you were born in 1900, our grandparents, you would be familiar with diseases, infectious diseases that, that afflicted children and killed them. And there was nothing parents could do. You would watch your child cough to death of a, of a disease that we can't even pronounce anymore. These things would just come in waves. And, and as you, you mentioned polio, people were terrified of these things that could just kill their children. There was nothing to do about it. If they didn't kill them, they were traumatized by, by memories of, or physically ailing for the rest of their lives. Medical science has advanced and given our generation the ability to not look back and to go, oh, you know, we don't need this anymore because we're all fine. You know, look how healthy we are. Actually, we are not healthy because we're actually 40% obese. And that's another problem that we have. And it is, it does have to do with our spoiled kind of generation. Medicine, medicine can keep obese people alive in a way that they probably couldn't have years ago. So we just dismiss. And the, the fact that we're still looking at in the newspaper this morning, the, the Times is reporting uh, enormous percentages of, of Americans refusing to take this, this vaccine, that, it, that the taking of it is a community act, really. Um, so let's anyway, back, I can go on and lecture to, on this. Let's get back to China. Uh, Trump uh, was quick to blame China, call it the China virus. We still don't know exactly uh, where the coronavirus sprang from. Is it, did it come from a bat, bats in a bat cave or was it the result of a uh, lab leak in, uh, in Hunan? You covered that in your book. Uh, but isn't it true that uh, China on January 10, 2020, uh, posted on the internet the uh, genetic DNA formula for the coronavirus, which uh, COVID-19, which was essential to the development of the vaccine? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can talk about that lab leak theory, which I think more and more scientists that I talk to think is plausible. Um, but before we get to that, uh, yes, they, they posted in January, early January, the genetic uh, code of the virus. And within three days, American scientists had made the vaccine that we have now got. It, 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 it's that fast. And that is an amazing milestone in medicine. And that the, the, the only reason that it wasn't already, it wasn't, they weren't able to make it and put it in our arms earlier is that we had to test it when you're going to uh when you're going to vaccinate that many people obviously it has to go through trial after trial normal times it could have taken a decade to get it over the the uh the hump but because they the government said you know we're, we're lifting this these rules you can we're going to move forward the the thing that they did right in the uh in the previous administration was to, to throw this money at big pharma at these six companies and say we will pay for it if it doesn't work we are going to you are not going to get litigated against if it hurts people and uh we'll buy it and so they, they the, the the companies went forward and made it now that pfizer know, pfizer wouldn't take the money pfizer didn't take pfizer didn't take because pfizer didn't want to have the restrictions that were going to be applied by the by the united states government in terms of in, in terms of those t tests but uh, now, Pfizer, let's, Pfizer let's, did then send, did then sell, cut a deal for almost two billion dollars. I mean, that's why we have so much Pfizer here. They they cut the deal in the summer. They just didn't take that that upfront money. 
Let's talk about the anti-vax uh, movement. Um, we, of course, have had uh, bad experiences with uh, vaccines in the past, but the theory of those vaccines was to inject people with live virus. And if you inject too much, they get the disease. If you inject too little, it's ineffective. Uh, this is a totally different approach, isn't it? Totally different. At least Moderna and Pfizer. Yes, the, the mRNA vaccines are completely different. Um, they are, that's why they are a landmark, a milestone in medicine. They're a completely different platform. All the vaccines that came before it, including the 15 that, are, that, get, that we give to babies in this country, are based on that vaccine that was invented in the late 1700s, where they took cowpox, a, a weaker version of smallpox, and started putting it into people and that, and they understood if it doesn't kill the concept as I write about the concept was if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. And, but I mean, obviously they weren't trying to kill people, but all of the vaccines, all the developments of the vaccines over these hundred or so years when they were really making them in the 20th century, all of them are accompanied with side effects, accidents, you know, originally they would, they would test them on themselves or their own children, these inventors. And in fact, the Russians, I just was listening to this podcast, the Russians did that just now with their Sputnik vaccine. They, the scientists like injected themselves. Um, you know, the, um, the accidents, the, the problems with them, the risks, the side effects, it's always kind of a, a boomerang or not a boomerang, sort of an elastic kind of, there's an advance and then there's a pullback because people see, oh, you know, you hear somebody got sick or somebody didn't react well to it. And you see that happening here, except that in this case, these vaccines, as far as I know, the mRNAs have not had any kind of extreme um, side effects that, such as the, um, the other ones, the, the J&J &J and the AstraZeneca, which are, really, are still kind of like the former platform because they are using uh, an actual biological agent, this, this type of a virus that's, that, you know, that, that they've, they've it manipulated, but it is a virus. Whereas the, the mRNA is completely synthetic. It is created by putting some proteins together, and making it look like the, the coronavirus spike, and then putting it inside a lipid. And then the lipid gets past your body's defenses. And then it tells your cells, if you see something that looks like this, make, you know, defend yourself. And then that little messenger just goes away. It's, it's not part of your body anymore. And so the, it makes the antibodies, it, it's, it's an amazing milestone. And I think the, um, uh, the people who are resisting this now are, um, you know, there, there are, obviously there are many, many different types of anti-vaxxers, Jim, right? We have, you have low information people, you have people who have reasons to be suspicious of, of medicine, like, you know, African-Americans with the Tuskegee experiment. You don't put that in my arm. I don't know what that is. Then you have you know, people in my community who are, you know, educated and super organic. And they're, as one of my, my sources said, chemophobic, they're chemophobic. If it's not natural, I don't want it in my body. Okay. Well, that's all dizzying. Uh, but let's just uh, get down to uh, Trump's response because the subtitle of your book includes the hijacking of America's response to the pandemic. Uh, you write, at every decision point, those in the Trump regime chose ideology over compassion, politics over science, opportunism over competence. How was the response hijacked? Well, I mean, well, for two major ways, two pillars of the, of the Trump administration were evangelical Christian white Americans who got him elected and needed to be paid back. That's one pillar. And the other are this sort of anti-state, libertarian, extreme free marketeers, right? And those two were, those were the pillars, not the rabble, which everybody likes to talk about, but those were the pillars of his political power. So the first thing they did, first thing he did when he got into office in 2016 was, or 2017 after inauguration, was he paid back the, the evangelical Christians by putting their people in charge of public health. So HHS, you know, up to, at the top of the CDC, he had Redfield, Burks is in there. Now, H A Azar is an evangelical Christian who actually sponsored the cabinet Bible study 
program that was going on inside the White House. The founders of our country have been rolling their graves. I mean, they're not supposed to mix church and state like that. And they had Ralph Drollinger every week in there with these evangelical uh, Christians, Ben Carson and, and company, all of them, Pompeo, they're all evangelical Christians. They gave them, to, they gave the public health agencies to the evangelical Christians because they are paying them back by, by saying, you can have this so you can put your religious liberty conscious conscience uh, uh, projects in there. You can, you can support pharmacists and, and others who don't want to work with women who need contraception or transgender issues or LGBTQ. And you can morally police people through public health. Emblematic is that he put Pence in charge of the whole thing. Pence was anti, anti science. His whole history in Indiana was anti science. He put Pence in charge of the coronavirus task force. And yes, the testing. Okay, so the testing was the WHO originally in January or February had a test, a, a model, and they said, You want this? Nope, we're not going to take your test. That's all that has to do with xenophobia and the, the resistance to being for the United States to be involved with any of these, you know, the UN. Well, Trump said, I like the, I like the numbers low. Let's and he liked the empty, so he liked the numbers low. They didn't want the test. Numbers. He didn't want to, they didn't want to test people. And if you didn't test people, you weren't going to know where it was. And of course it was all over before they start, before they even got the tests to people who were already in New York city, where it was just a foot, everybody had it. By, by what the about the big lie? Everyone uh, wants a test can get one. Yeah, the other big lie. I mean, I, I opened I open the book with this scene of him, you know, at, at the CDC on March 6th, announcing with Azar standing next to him and Redfield, who, by the way, is also an evangelical Christian, and this other, uh, and Le Kelly Leffler back there trying to get a photo op with him. And he's saying, you know, anybody can get a test, you know, 4 million tests have been, are going to be released next week. Everybody in that room on the official side knew that was a total lie. The press was sitting there writing it down, taking it down, you know, and that's, you know, so that's the first thing. And we remember that. We remember that. You and I and everybody who lived here in this country rem remembered that in March they were saying this and every, anybody who wanted to get one could not get one. You know, you couldn't go and get one and we knew we couldn't get one. So that was, that was the first big lie. And, and then, then the what, about the, thing, what about the junk science, uh, hydroxychloroquine and taking bleach and, uh, uh, yeah, and, or, and, 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 and you know, the thing about the hydroxychloroquine and that they, they were able to get the FDA to approve that right away for emergency use when the, when the whole medical community was like, I don't think so, not quite, we're not sure about that. They were able to move very quickly. They moved that bureaucracy very quickly, yet they weren't able to move the bureaucracy very quickly when they needed to get those tests fixed, which the CDC had bollocked up. So they didn't do that when they needed it, but they could do it when they wanted to. So that's the that's the evangelical Christian side of it, the health department, the health agencies, and then of course the other side is the pandemic profiteering, the the um, the no good time. Chaos, well, chaos, well, chaos capitalism. There's chaos, and, and chaos there's opportunity, and all of these, you know, it was no bid contracts. You know, they're still they're they're never going to figure out where all that money went. What about uh, Trump's politicization? Wear a mask and you're a liberal. You yeah. don't get it. Well, this, you know, the, this, the, that again, there was, there was a problem early on with the doctors and the who they said, no, you don't need the masks. And then they pivoted. So big mistake on the medical side, because then you had every single person who didn't want to wear one had a reason to say, well, they didn't know what they were talking about. They changed their minds, but yes, Trump politicized it. So, you know, you and I walking around in masks, if I went across the river to Pennsylvania, where I live at, in the summer, it was like wearing a Biden sign on your face. Are we prepared in your view? Well, if, if another pandemic comes within the next year or two, yes, we're prepared because we clearly are gonna not forget this, but are we going to forget it the way we forgot the, the 1919 flu? I tend to think that it's possible we won't because this is again, technology has enabled us to, uh, unlike any other pandemic in history, to witness in real time that this is a species wide event. It's happening to everyone all over the world. And we can see the suffering on our little handheld screens anytime we want to. So we understand that this is, ha this is happening to all of us and that we're vulnerable, vulnerable in this way. And I think that that memory will stick. Uh, but again, you know, like the, like the 1919 uh, situation, 
as soon as it was over, people just want to turn around and go forward and, and forget about this horrible stuff. So I don't know. Okay, so uh, we've come to the end and I have a question for you, Nina Burley. And the question is, if the Trump administration had acted reasonably to combat the virus, how many lives in your estimation would have been saved? This is not my estimation. Deborah Burks, his own uh, you know, medical advisor, has said, since she's not in the administration anymore, that, that you know, hundreds of thousands of lives would have been saved. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of American lives. If they, this was all avoidable. This is the richest country in the world filled with experts and they just dispensed with, with that and, and went forward, um, as I said, for, for their own gain. All avoidable. So Nina Burley, thank you so much for coming by. This has been absolutely marvelous. Thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more conversations I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, be well, be safe, and all the best.